Today, I was able to go to uh, the place of burial of both my uh, mother and my father, Dana and Boris Bogayev, uh, which is in Jackson, New Jersey. And uh, it's not very far from our hometown, which is just the next township over, maybe about a 20, 30 minutes drive if there's no traffic. Um, it's very interesting because the whole place is a Russian Orthodox church and cemetery, which you will see in the, in the pictures. And it's interesting because the Kalmyks, which is one sect of the Mongolian people, uh, the Kalmyks, immigrated to the United States in the 50s and 60s together with the Russians. And because the Kalmyk people's names are similar to foreign ears to that of Russian, they just assumed that they're um, some kind of Russians. In fact, that time in immigration, um, Asian people were not encouraged to move to the United States. But because the Mongolian people had Russian sounding names, although they're not Russian names, um, they were allowed in. And there was a particular uh, Russian person who actually talked to immigration and allowed all the Kalmyks to come in. And so the Kalmyk community here, um, K-L-M-U-C-K, Kalmyk community, which again I repeat is a, is a branch of, a branch of a Mongolian people. Um, and the Russians, the Mongols, the Kalmyks and the Russians live together in Howell, New Jersey. And they um, share a lot of cultural ties also because they came together. And Kalmyk, the land Kalmyk, has its own province in Western Russia, in the European part of Russia. And it is the only province or uh, independent state that is a Buddhist state in Europe. You can Google and take a look. Um, my parents are Kalmyks, and they belong to the Torgut tribe. And they lived in Howell, New Jersey since they immigrated from uh, Eastern Europe and Russia and whatnot uh, in the 50s. What happens was during World War I, Many of the Kalmyk people who lived in Russia, uh, which is their homeland, uh, for centuries had to immigrate to Eastern Europe to escape the war. And that was in Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, France, uh, Germany. Uh, those are the kind of countries that the Kalmyks had immigrated to in the World War I wave of immigration. Then when World War II hit, Many of these Kalmyk families remained in Europe, uh, but a vast majority also immigrated to the United States because um, it was very difficult under um, during the war times. So they immigrated over to the U.S. to Howell, New Jersey. And why Howell, New Jersey? Because they were assigned there uh, by immigration. And they came with the Russian people. So the Kalmyks here in Howell built three beautiful temples. Uh, because they're very fierce and strong, uh, um, strongly attached to their culture and their religion and their language and their, and their background. And the beautiful Russian people built their Russian Christian Orthodox churches in this area also. A, a lot more Russians immigrated here than Mongols, than Kalmyks. Um, so they, they've been, you know, cohabitating for centuries together uh, because the Russian the Russian country in it has the Republic of Kalmykia or the Kalmyk People's Republic. As I say, take a Google, it's quite interesting. Now, um, our people are Mongolians, but the particular branch is called Kalmyk. And they lived in uh, Western Russia in World War I. They immigrated to Eastern and parts of Europe. And from Europe in World War II, they immigrated again to the United States. And this is where they settled, and this is where they worked, and they built their houses, they had their community, and this is where I grew up. I came to the U.S. in 1972, and uh, I grew up here in these parts, in this area. And uh, I know many of the comic people, hundreds, and I've seen them. Some of them I don't know by name because there's so many of them, but I definitely know them by face. 
um, because there's a special tradition during Kalmyk New Year's, which is a Buddhist New Year's. It, it's around January, February every year, depends on the uh, lunar calendar. We will visit all the Kalmyk elders, we will visit all the Kalmyk families and houses, bringing gifts, and uh, they will visit us bringing gifts. And that was a tradition every single year. And the kids would get big um, money gifts from the elder comics because it was a time for them to share. It was a very happy and, and uh, exciting festive occasion. Well, I left Howell, New Jersey uh, because I had a lot, a lot, a lot of conflicts with my parents, with my mother and my father, because they were set dead against me practicing Buddhism uh, deeply and becoming a monk and joining the monastery. Yes, they were Buddhists themselves, but they didn't have any other children. And because they didn't have any other children, uh, they didn't want me, they didn't have any of the sons, I'm sorry, they have other children. Um, they didn't have any of the sons, they only had me. They had one other daughter. So they had no other children besides us, just a son and a daughter. And uh, the sons are not supposed to become monks if you only have one son. So that is our tradition. And, but deep inside of me, I observed the people around me and I observed their life and I observed school and work and building houses. And it didn't interest me. It didn't fascinate me. And in fact, it um, really made me see how life was. And I didn't really want to get into that situation of just getting educated, going to work, drinking, enjoying myself, so-called enjoying eating, festivals, parties age and then you die. I didn't really want to get into that. I wanted to do something more. It was a very strong inner urge for me to practice Dharma, join the monasteries and to do meditations. And that's what I did as a young child. But it was to the very strong objection of my mom. And as I got stronger into Buddhism, um, practice a meditation study, then her opposition towards this became stronger and it became very physical and violent um, where she would actually beat me or hit me um, many 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 times with anything she can get her hands on to stop me um, she did it in my interest she did it for my interest this is how she was brought up and this is what she thought she didn't do it to harm me because she's not a, she's not a negative person but she did it to stop me because she thought that I wouldn't be happy doing this so um, I, was, I ran away from home several times and my last attempt to run away from home was when I was um, around 15, uh, going on 16. And uh, I hitchhiked across the United States and I ended up in Los Angeles. I went from New Jersey to New York. New York, I hitchhiked across to Los Angeles and I joined a Dharma Center. And from there, I met my guru, Kyabja Saramji. When I met Saramji, uh, I was invited over to Gandhi Monastery, and at 23 years old, I finally went to Gandhi Monastery. But um, I came back to New Jersey once after I met my guru to confirm that I would go to India. I came back to New Jersey once, twice after I left, but as I remember, once after I had confirmed I wanted to become a monk. And I went to say goodbye to my mom. I want to say goodbye to my dad and um, one or two close family members because I didn't stay very long. I had to rush back to go to work. Um, and at that time, my mom, I brought her red roses, which is her favorite. She loves red roses. And um, I spent a little time with her, a day or two, and I explained to her what I was going to do. She was not accepting. She was polite. She was happy I came home. She, was, she cooked and she talked. And, but basically she was extremely opposed to me going to become a monk. But she couldn't stop me anymore because I already became a big boy. I was already in my 20s and she knew that she couldn't stop me. And uh, I didn't go to become a monk to hurt her or to oppose her, but this is what I needed to do. This was inside of me. It was very, very strong since I was young. And my mother did everything she can to stop it, but it was, she couldn't. Um, so that time when I said goodbye to my parents, I said goodbye to my mom, it was very poignant because she told me that um, after I put the red robes on to my skin, she told me in Mongolian, that once I put the red robes onto my skin, then I would um, 
not be her son anymore. Basically, she would disown me. Um, it was very sad for me, and I would like to have had her support, but with or without her support, I was going to go to India, and I did. So um, I went to India, and I had a very difficult time there, uh, financially speaking, because I didn't have any sponsors, and it was very hard for me to survive, and I needed about 50 US dollars a month to survive. And it was very difficult to survive because I had no sponsors, and I had no one. And I'd written one or two, I, I'd written several letters to my parents, Dana and Boris Bogayev, and I asked them for financial help. And uh, my mother never replied. My father wrote that uh, I made my bed and uh, I better sleep in it. And it's too bad. And if I give up everything and I come home, then they'll buy me a car, they'll put me through university. And uh, basically in the future, I remember vaguely that time that the house and property, all that will come to me. But uh, it didn't interest me, and I stayed in India, and they never supported me, and gradually our communications became less and less and less. And later on, I found out that uh, they had passed away. Um, I never got to see them again since 1987. I never, ever got to see them again, so what, that's over 26 years. Um, I never got to talk with them on the phone again. I never got to communicate with them and uh, nothing. And these are my parents. So this time I came back to uh, my hometown, Howell, New Jersey. Uh, and I came quietly and, and uh, uh, very privately because I know quite a lot of people here and I know a lot of um, friends here. But on this trip, I'm in a slight um, search to compile things for a biography book that's coming out and I didn't have time to meet people I didn't meet any disrespect to anyone but I didn't really have time and I needed to focus on what I needed to do which is my work uh, but part of it was that uh, I wanted to go see my um, house where I grew up which we have a beautiful family living there Mr. and Mrs. Bullock and their and their um, daughter and uh, I knocked on the door and they let me in and they graciously showed me the house that they had bought for my mom and how um, they had taken care of the house. You know, we went to see the cellar, the, the main area, the upstairs. We saw the backyard. We saw every part of the house and they spent about two hours talking. And uh, they had met my mother and they had said that she was very proud of the house and uh, she used to drive by to look at the house even though she had sold it to them. And the Bullocks were also very, very kind because they told me, especially Mrs. Bullock, that um, in their course of interaction of selling the house, my mother selling the house over to the Bullocks, that my mother had told Mrs. Bullock that she was very proud of me and that she had kept my picture and that I'm a Buddhist monk and I'm a teacher and that she was very, very happy and proud for me. And that really blew me away because my mother had come to terms with me becoming a monk. She had finally come to terms. And what's incredible is I left and we lost contact because I wanted to become a Buddhist monk and because I wanted to become a uh, um, study Buddhism more. We left, I left because of this. And my mother told me that she had disowned me. And now I hear an opposite story 25 years later, 26 years later, from the person who bought the house over from my parents. And they told me that they had met my parents and they had said that my mother was very proud of me and she was very happy for me and she was very glad that I had become a monk and that I pursued what I wanted to pursue. And that really, really, really um, touched me very deeply because to hear it from a wonderful cu couple Mr. and Mrs. Bullock, who had never met prior to this. They're the new owners of our family home, and they had welcomed me into their house so generously and graciously, because um, I didn't contact them, I didn't, I didn't call them, I don't know them, I just knocked on their door and they let me in. Um, coming from this couple that had, are living in the house my parents lived in, and they, my parents had built, and they told me my mother was very proud, so that's amazing. And so I wanted to share that 
When I was younger, I wanted my mother and my father's approval for becoming a monk. Getting their approval was very important. Um, if I got their approval, there would be less opposition. I can come back to Howell and visit them and other, other family members and friends and Dharma friends. Um, I would get a little bit of financial support when I was in a monastery to help me pay for food and small utilities. Um, I would have a family to go back to during holidays. I remember in the, in the monastery, in the holidays, many of the monks, their families would visit them or they would go back to their families to spend time with them in various parts of India, sometimes even Tibet. But I had nowhere to go. Um, it was sad in the beginning because I was very young and I was, um, it was lonely knowing that you don't have family and you don't have parents and your parents are alive but they refuse to acknowledge you and they had disowned you. But to me, to be disowned was painful and hurtful but the Dharma is worth it. And if I had to go back to do it again, I would do it again. Um, and I don't mean disrespect to my parents. So, for my mother to have stopped me or attempted to stop me and to beat me and to um, hurl a lot of verbal abuses, uh, to stop me to do Dharma when I was younger is very, very bad karma because Someone is trying to engage in Dharma practice. Someone is trying to become a monk. Someone is trying to learn and someone is trying to lift themselves out of samsara and become an enlightened being to become a Buddha. That's what the Buddha taught us. And you are stopping this person. So when you stop this person from doing something very virtuous, of course, every day they cannot practice. Every day they are in samsara. Every day they are stuck in the world. Every day they are stuck in their daily unenlightened activities. Is caused by you. And when it's caused by you, the karma is very heavy is because the karma will return to us that when we want to do something very positive for ourselves, we want to do something spiritual and enlightening and um, do something that awakens us, we will be stopped. And at the worst, at the worst, we will continuously think that other people who engage in spiritual practice are wrong, are bad, and it takes away from our happiness, and we are unhappy, and uh, things are not good, and that by just living and eating and sleeping and abiding and residing, that we will think that we are happy, in fact, when we are not. So when we stop other people from doing Dharma, or we disturb other people from doing Dharma, it could be our parents, it could be our siblings, it could be our friends, it could be our spouse, it could be anyone off the street, it could be anyone. When they actually do their best to stop us, or interrupt us, or create schism, or create negative talk, they create the karma for themselves not to do Dharma in the future. Why is that? Because they are stopping you. Whether they believe in what you're doing, whether they like what you're doing, or whether they perceive it as positive or negative, that is their subjective views. But if we're going to do Dharma, it is positive. If we're going to follow the Buddha's teachings, it is positive. If we're going to do a Buddha's practice and meditations to cultivate our mind, to improve ourselves, to become compassionate, to be forgiving, and to gain higher insight, it's definitely positive. Because higher insight, compassion, and wisdom, and all these qualities are gained in the mind. And the mind is what we take with us always. From our mind comes our speech, from our mind comes our body actions. So whatever is our state of mind is very important because that dictates our future. And it dictates the, it influences people around us. So therefore, if we can practice Buddhism, meditate, study, learn, have insight, contemplate, and we can transform our mind from um, negative to positive, from more positive to more positive, more positive. We can create happiness within ourselves, within ourselves. We can create happiness with the people around us. And this happiness can spread. And this happiness comes from us transforming our minds. Our minds transforming comes from us learning the Dharma, contemplating, meditating, and practicing. And so therefore, doing Dharma in any way is really, really positive and excellent. 
So therefore, when people try to stop you from doing excellent and positive things, if their intent is negative and harmful, and um, whether it's out of ignorance, knowingly or unknowingly, it's inherently a bad action. When I say this, I don't mean to scourge or say negative things about my parents, but the truth is the truth. Honestly, that a lot of negative karma was con collected by my parents who tried to stop me from doing Dharma. Yes, they didn't know. Yes, they were ignorant. Yes, they didn't understand. But they had the option to study. They had the option to understand the Dharma more. But they chose having a so-called uh, secular life. Uh, there could have been a balance, but they chose not to. They were Buddhists, but they chose to do very basic, superficial Buddhist practices according to what they know. So therefore, um, them stopping me, it is out of ignorance, but there is still negative karma. Whether we step whether we step on an animal, or an insect, on purpose or by accident, the karmic effects are varying depending on knowing and not knowing, but still the action of killing an insect still will have negative repercussions, whether we know it or not. Knowing is worse, not knowing is less. So therefore, people who try to stop us from Dharma, you know, even people who try to defame us, or hurt us, or say negative things, those actions will create more anger in their minds. Those actions will create more unhappiness in their minds. Those actions will create more instability and an unsettling feeling. And they may tell the world they're happy, they're happy, they're happy, they're settled, they're happy, they're happy, they're happy. But if you're so happy, you don't need to convince people you're happy. As simple as that. You don't need to convince people if you're happy or not. It'll glow from the inside. And whatever happiness they experience without Dharma is only temporary. Because if we follow the Four Noble Truths, all actions lead to some sort of suffering. Mental, physical, definitely leads to some kind of suffering. So therefore, practicing Dharma is the highest, is the best. It's one of the best ways that we can use our lives. We benefit other people directly and indirectly, and we definitely benefit ourselves. So by my mother accepting me finally in her mind to do Dharma, I rejoice. I feel happy. I don't feel happy in an egotistical way where I get approval. Wow, my mom approves of me practicing Dharma, of being a monk. She's proud of me. I mean, it's nice to hear. It's, it's wonderful to hear, but the main issue here is not so much that I needed her approval to practice Dharma. I never needed my mother's approval or anyone's approval to practice Dharma. I know Dharma is good. I know meditation and study and application and contemplation of Buddhism and Dharma is good. I know it is good. Um, there's just too much proof that it is good. So therefore, I don't need my mom's affirmation. I don't need her approval. I don't need my parents' approval. But I am sincerely happy to hear from the blocks that my parents are happy and they did approve and they finally accept it because from the time they did not accept until the time they accepted, they created a lot of negative karma, a negative imprint in their mind against Dharma. But from the time they accepted until their passing, they created a lot of positive karma. They created a lot of positive imprints. They created a lot of positive merits. Then everything I do, a part of the merits will go to them. So therefore, my mother having a turnaround in her mind of accepting me is not so much that I need her approval. I don't think we need to live our lives waiting for approval, waiting for judgment, waiting for people to say that my Dharma practice, my spiritual journey is correct or not correct. What we need to do is, we, what we need to understand is we are doing the right thing when we practice Dharma. We are. And when we practice Dharma, we shouldn't harm, harm others. We shouldn't create schism. We shouldn't say, write, or intimate negative things about other people, about teachers, about organizations, about Dharma centers, because everyone is trying their best. No matter how bad we say something is, there's always something good in it also. No matter how, how badly we perceive a group, a teacher, a lama, 
or a monk or an organization, no matter how bad we perceive it, there is good also. So when we only perceive the bad and talk about the bad, we negate the good and the opportunity for others to get any good. Maybe it was not good for us, but it doesn't mean it was not good for everyone else. Just because something is not good for us, we don't need to blast it and destroy it because thinking, wow, I don't like it, so no one else can have it. That's not, that's not, that's not bodhicitta or compassion or care. That's more coming from a negative point of view. Um, so therefore, my hearing, my mother was happy and, and uh, accepted my monkhood and my practice really meant a lot to me. It really touched me and I, thanks, I thank the Bullock family very much for letting me know. And this trip was very wonderful because I found that out. And it's important because now I know that from the time my mother accepted, which was in the 90s, up till her death, she didn't collect any more negative karma by thinking negatively about my Dharma practice. And in fact, I don't see it as an ego trip that she accepted, that I am okay, that I am a good monk, and I, am, I did the right thing. I don't think of that at all. I think of it that she stopped collecting negative karma, and I'm so happy for her in that way. Um, I'm so happy she stopped having negative thoughts and, and uh, negative views and speaking negatively, which she did earlier. I'm very happy about that, and I rejoice because in a secular way of looking at it, my mother found peace with what I am doing. My mother, yes, found peace with what I have been doing. And her peace is worth billions to me. Her peace is what I'm happy about. Her peace and acceptance in her mind before she passed is what's very important to me. So her accepting what I'm doing doesn't become an ego trip for me that I'm approved. I have the seal of rule. I'm all right. I'm good. I didn't need to know that. I know I'm doing the right thing. My teachers already told me. But my mother accepted, so she was at peace. And she came to terms with what I'm doing. Although I never got to speak to her again after I left in 1987, now I know she was at peace. And she was happy and she was proud. And all the time that she washed me, and she fed me, and she, she took care of me, and she cleaned me, and she, she put me to bed, and she nursed me when I was sick, it didn't go to waste. It didn't go to waste because her son didn't grow up to be something that she would have considered wasted. She was proud of what he grew up to do. I'm happy about that. So today, I went to her grave site. My father and my mother are buried together. And uh, it is a Russian Orthodox burial site with a Russian Orthodox church. Beautiful. The beautiful, you'll see on the post, there's a beautiful, it's a beautiful church with um, the Madonna and child on the front of the church. And then surrounding it is all the Russian people who had passed away. And then when you go towards the back, there's new plots of land where all the Kalmyks are buried. And what's beautiful is because the Kalmyks are all Buddhist, the Kalmyks are all Buddhist, and they're buried together with their Christian brothers and sisters. Because the Russians and Kalmyks are very close in life and in death, they're also buried together. So towards the front, you'll see um, a lot of Russian Orthodox crosses, which is one, two, three, four strokes. And um, towards the back, you'll see the Kalmyks buried with Buddha's Dharma wheel, or Buddha images, or mantras carved onto the gravestones. The mantras that you see uh, carved on the gravestones predominantly are Om Mani Peme Hong, which is Chen Ezik Kuan Yin's mantra, Om Wangi Shuri Mum, which is Manjushri's mantra, and Om Benza Pani Hong, which is Vajapani's mantra. So many of the gravestones of the Mongols have either Buddha's images engraved onto it, or it has a Dharma wheel engraved onto it, or has um, uh, the mantras of the three bodhisattvas engraved onto it. And what's beautiful is uh, some of the Mongols, some of the Kalmyk men had married Russian wives, and they are buried side by side. So you will see in the pictures that I've included tombstones, gravestones, and you'll see the husband on the left with the Dharma wheel, the husband's name on the left with the Dharma wheel, and the wife's name on the right 
with a Russian Orthodox cross or a cross. So you see a Dharma wheel and a cross on one gravestone, which is husband and wife. Because the Kalmyks do not believe in converting people. And they don't believe in changing people's religion. They respect people's religion. That's what I grew up with. So you see a lot of interracial and interreligious marri marriages among the Mongols, the Kalmyks. And uh, they respect each other's religion. What was incredible is when I went to the grace, and this is the way it should be, this kind of respect in life and in death. And if we have more religious acceptance and harmony in the world, there'll be more peace. So when I entered this grave, when I entered this uh, church and this graveyard, it was my first time. Uh, it was in the afternoon around 3 o'clock, and the sun was bright. The wind was slightly strong and crisp and cool. And the whole place, the whole um, graveyard and churchyard was so well kept, so neat and so clean. And you feel a quiet type of sadness, yet peace. Lots of trees, lots of grass. And I walked to the back and um, I saw my parents' gravestones buried side by side. And um, Andrew and Sing Piao were very kind and they um, set up everything for me wonderfully. Flowers and uh, I brought roses, red roses for my mom again. Candles and incense. And we also brought some foods and snacks and we set up and I was able to do a um, puja for my mother, my father, and all the people in the graveyard. And uh, I dedicated all the years that my mother spent her time, her love, her energy, her care, her money on me. I dedicated it all back to her now that I'm a monk, that she and my father and everyone there can take a wonderful rebirth. That they in the future will meet the Dharma they in the future will understand the Dharma, practice the Dharma, and gain attainments. By my parents having association with me in this life, may they create the imprints in their future to take rebirth and practice the Dharma, which they were not able to do much in this life, and therefore liberating themselves from samsara, liberating themselves from the mundaneness of repetitive rebirth. What was very poignant was right next to their, next to their gravestone was uh, one of my favorite cousins. Her name is Taktun, T-O-K-T-U-N, and she was buried right next to them. I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours with, uh, with uh, Taktun. We call her Gaga Taktun, which is auntie. Um, hundreds and hundreds of hours. And uh, she was a beautiful person on the inside. She was a beautiful person on the outside. Um, she was considered the Kalmyk version of Elizabeth Taylor. And um, I was told that men from Philadelphia and New York and Kalmyk men from Philadelphia, New York and New Jersey, various parts, would just drive by our house hoping to get a glimpse of her because she was so beautiful. And um, to me, she was beautiful, but her beauty to me was on the inside because she was such gentle, soft, caring, kind, non-obtrusive non -obtrusive person. She had a very difficult life because she was very tough on herself. But she was very kind to everyone around her. And it was very sad to see her there because I hadn't seen her in 25 years. And the last time I saw her was in her house. And now she's buried under the hard, cold ground next to my parents. My uncle and auntie, Uncle Nadin and Aunt Honey, are buried there. My uncle Jija is buried there. Um, my uncle Jean Polchinov. Uncle Jean Polshinov is buried there. Um, a lot of our Mongolian neighbors, elderly people, friends, even people I grew up with, a lot of people are buried there. And I can say that in this Mongolian section, the Kalmyk section of the graveyard, I knew about 55 to 60 percent of the people there buried. And I would say there was easily maybe 200 to 250, maybe 300 buried there. Because some gravestones share double or triple. So I knew about 50 to 55, 60% of the people buried there. Um, either by name or by face. And um, I had seen these people. I didn't know whether they were alive. I didn't know whether they were passed away. I hadn't seen these people since I left um, Howell. 
and it was very sad to see so many people from my childhood dead and buried under the ground. And it, was, it is a fall day, winter's coming soon, and it was getting cold, and I just saw the cold, hard ground and all these beautiful people buried under. People that I've grown up with, people who are giving me ang pao's, are giving me um, presents, people are giving me uh, gifts, people who had shared meals with, people who had uh, played with me, all types of people. There was even one girl there called Evelyn uh, Adianov, and she died in her 30s. And I remember as a kid going to her house, her father's name is Norin Adianov, and I used to go to his house, and because my father is good friends with him to visit, and um, she'd always be there giving me food or talking to me and entertaining me. She was a beautiful young girl, a very nice girl. I didn't, I, she passed away, and her gravestone was there, I, and I, I saw her picture, because a lot of the gravestones have pictures on it. Incredible. There were so many people there that I knew or grew up with. Um, Bolosin and Segla and and uh, even my uncle uh, Ochir, one of my favorite uncles Ochir, they're all there. Anyways, I was able to do a transferring of the merits puja for my parents, who, for which I am grateful for. I don't know when I can be back here to visit again, because I live quite far. I don't know when, but I'd like to come back to do more pujas for them in the future and for all my cousins there. And I'd like to come the next time to bring more flowers for all the people that I know there. I'm going to need quite a lot of flowers. Um, but I am so glad that I was able to come. And I wouldn't say that I have closure because closure doesn't depend on me seeing my parents' gravestones. Closure comes within me knowing that I know that I did the right thing. And that's what's important. So uh, it was very good for me to see the gravestone of my parents. It was good because I was able to do prayers there. I was able to make offerings to the Buddhas. I was able to bring my mother's favorite roses to her. And it was very sad because I'm sitting in front of her gravestone knowing that she is right under me in a coffin, buried, and probably bones already. And everything that, all the memories that passed, all are buried now. But again, knowing that she was proud of me and she accepted me meant so much to me because I am at peace that she died in peace. I repeat, I am at peace that she died in peace. That she didn't have any negative feelings towards me, her son, which she does not deserve. And also, her acceptance of me is not an ego trip for me that I am accepted and I'm okay, but it would have been easier if she had accepted me years ago. We could have communicated for years. We could have written letters, called. I could have visited many times. I could have shared the Dharma with her. And that's my biggest regret, is that I wasn't allowed to share the Dharma with her. She didn't accept it. And uh, that's my biggest regret. Um, even when the Buddha left the palace, and his parents were against him to become a monk and, and seek his spiritual direction and his spiritual destiny. After he became enlightened, the Buddha came back home and taught his father Dharma, his stepmother Dharma, his son Dharma, his wife Dharma. He had a wife before he left. He even ascended to the heaven of the 33 to teach Dharma to his mother. And he was very happy he was able to bring Dharma to his parents because his parents had raised him, took care of him. Well, definitely I'm not the Buddha, but I would like to have emulated that, to have come home decades ago, from time to time, in my robes, to teach the Dharma to my parents, to do pujas for them while they're alive. If we do pujas for them while they're alive, it's more effective than after they have passed away. If we do pujas for them after they have passed away, a part of the merits will go, but not as strong as if they were alive and they have accepted. Anyway, during their lifetime, they had met high lamas, and they had done many omani pemehongs, they had made offerings on their shrine, they have gone for services, so there's imprints of dharma in their mind. And now, the best thing for me is to continue my dharma work, and to continue dedicating my merits toward my parents, towards my cousins, my uncles, and all those people buried there, and to all sentient beings, in fact, 
So do help me in my Dharma journey and my practice, do help me in what I wish to do, do help me in bringing the Dharma to many, because whatever benefits I can bring my parents, you can bring it to your parents. By joining me and doing Dharma with me or doing Dharma wherever you are with your teacher and your group or just on your own, you can bring tremendous merits to your parents, to your lineage, to your family, to the people you love. There is no other way we can bring happiness to others on an ultimate level except through Dharma because everything is eaten, is released, is used, is gone and eventually we die. So therefore, my mother was at peace and she accepted the Dharma. From that she gained a lot of merits by rejoicing in what I'm doing. By rejoicing what I'm doing, she gained a lot of merits and I'm happy that by my actions, I was able to indirectly help my mother and my father. Today visiting the cemetery of my parents was a moving experience. Thank you.